the old question, why are we here? <laughs> on a Tuesday, it's amazing on the way down here how many cars and trucks are on the road at any time of the day anymore. Uh, Pennsylvania and Jersey is just overrun with, uh, like it says in the Bible, too many chariots, they're everywhere. First thing we're going to look at, we're going to look at uh, the Torah, and we're going to get some of our instructions for this day. If you turn to Leviticus 23, verses 4 to 6. Leviticus 23, verses 4 to 6. It says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Also Numbers chapter 28. Numbers 28. Verses 16 to 18. Numbers 28, 16 to 18. In the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. In the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. In the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do manner of servile work therein. That's the day we're in today. Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33 and verse 3. And they departed from Ramses in the first month on the fifteenth day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. So here's three Three testimonies, three witnesses of the timing. Fourteenth is the Passover, fifteenth is the Days of Unleavened Bread. There's a lot of controversy, a lot of ideas kicked around out there. I love seeing it in God's Word, what it says. And uh, it's kind of pretty self-explanatory. Um, and they are beautiful days. It's a wonderful time of the year. Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 41 and 42, Exodus 12, 41 and 42. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. A lot of times we always heard that they did come out under a full moon on the 15th which is beautiful. I imagine it would be a lot warmer down in Egypt uh, than it is up in our area. Uh, but you can only picture that huge crowd of people coming out uh, wondering, first being delivered, but wondering what was ahead, what was going to be our next adventure. But seeing all those things that happened, how they were protected, all the plagues that happened in Egypt, uh, seeing uh, seeing the Eternal's hand in all of that must have been so exciting. Not only that, the Egyptians loading them up with gold and all kind of things as a, a kind of a payback uh, for the slavery they endured. And you know, you think about it, even when Aaron made, made the golden calf, <laughs> which was terrible, they broke off all these gold earrings uh, so they did have gold. They had gold when they left Egypt uh, and other riches, I'm sure. And they were told, get out. We don't want you here anymore. Exodus chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Exodus 13, verses 6 through 9. 
I'm going to misquote this for a reason. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread if you feel like it. That's not in there. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And you shall show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand and from a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. There's two places, at least two, that talk about that being a sign on your right hand and in your forehead. We all know about the mark of the beast, but this is the mark of God. When he talks about his law being between your, the frontlets of your eyes, in your brain, in your right hand, what you do your work with, that is our, that's part of our calling card. And uh, it's, it's beautiful to hear that and read that. Like I said, we know a lot about the mark of the beast and we speculate all kind of things about a mark in your hand or in your forehead. But here God's word tells you what, that, what his mark is. That's something that we all need to keep in mind. Second Chronicles chapter 30. Second Chronicles chapter 30. To me, this is an amazing story. You got to think about the Israelites. They come out with a high hand. For many years, they're wandering in the desert. And eventually, they do get into the promised land. And eventually, they forget about God's feasts. They forget about all of his days, his holy days. They get into idolatry. They get into a mess. And here is a king, Hezekiah. And all of a sudden, they discover God's law, the book of the law. So we're going to read quite a bit of this because the story is it's tremendous. Uh, starting in verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 30, starting in verse 1. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters unto Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Remember, if you couldn't take the Passover in the first month for a reason, the second month, 30 days later, you were able to take that Passover. And that's in Numbers 9, uh, chapters uh, Numbers 9, verses 10 and 11 tells you about that second Passover. It just shows you how important it is to keep that Passover. And it says in verse 3, For they could not keep it at that time, because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not, not done it for a long time, in such, uh, such short as it was written. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, You children of Israel, Turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings, kings of Assyria. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now be you not stiff-necked, as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. Serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. 
For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the posts passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim, Manasseh, even unto Zebulon, but they laughed them to scorn. Nevertheless, the verse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars there in Jerusalem, and all the altars for incense took they away, and they cast them in the brook Kidron. What an amazing thing. It's a turn. They're turning back to God. One of the first things they do after they repent is start smashing all the idols that were involved in their lives, throwing them into the brook Kidron. It's amazing. And that's something that the Passover does. And, you know, we can think about our own times. You know, we look around and think of all the brethren that I knew over the years, uh, some that have completely abandoned this. Maybe there'll be a renaissance one day, an awakening. And maybe they'll come back just like it happened here. You don't want to write anybody off. You know, they can. that can happen. That would be exciting to see. I don't know about you, when I look at my address book and I, I see the names in there, wow. So many, many have died, but many have just stopped doing these things that we're doing. All right, in verse 15, Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed, sanctified themselves, and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests sprinkled the blood which they had received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified, therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passover. For every one that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulon, had not cleansed themselves. Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written? But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one, that prepared his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers. Though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness and the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day singing with loud instruments unto the Lord and Hezekiah spoke comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord and they did eat throughout the feast seven days offering peace offerings making confession to the Lord God of their fathers and the whole assembly took counsel to keep other seven days and they kept other seven days with gladness that's amazing not only did they keep the feast in the second month the Passover the days of unleavened bread they added seven more days on and God blessed that there's a message in there for us we'll get to that uh, but to be so exciting about finding your way again and getting back on track. Uh, and here's the, to me, the, the real show of repentance and change. If you go right over to chapter 31, and verse 1, it says, Now when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah, broke the images in pieces, cut down the groves, threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin, 
and Ephraim also in Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned every man to his possession into their own cities. What an amazing testimony. On fire with passion for what they just went through. You know, when all of this happened, this was many hundreds of years before the time of Jesus Christ walked the earth. They did not have the information that we have, the added story. Okay, all of God's holy days, all of his feasts are shadowy types of the reality. Of course, the reality is Yeshua, the Messiah. We have something, the added extra information that they didn't have. Yet look what happened here. Even with the information they had, it turned their hearts. Although, when they first came out of Egypt and they first wandered around in the desert, they did have the Messiah with them. And that's in, we'll look at this, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. He wasn't there in the flesh. He was in his pre-incarnate state the word of God, here he was leading the Israelites, performing all of those amazing miracles. But coming down our time today, uh, where should we be? How excited should we be about the days of unleavened bread? Like I mentioned that little misquote there, if you feel like it. There was a teaching in the church a while back you don't have to necessarily eat it every day. The question I want to ask is, why don't you want to eat it every day? Why don't you want to eat it every day of your life? <laughs> That's the question I have. Uh, it's, it is something when we grasp the reality of what is happening in our lives and where we are, uh, it should be a desire. We should be thinking when we're eating. We'll get to that too. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yeshua says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When you celebrate these days of unleavened bread, with Yeshua being the focus, the center point, it becomes so exciting, so rewarding. Every day should be a, a real blessing as you do eat your matzah or however you make your unleavened bread, whether you put butter on there, peanut butter, whatever, but uh, it takes thinking while you're eating. And uh, the sacrifice of him as the Lamb of God cleanses us from sin. We become a new lump. I like this term, born again. That's, that's another term that was kind of uh, shot down many times. All right, even if you put the term in there, we are begotten. We should become new people. What's been done for us and our rededication every year at Passover, actually probably every day we should be rededicating ourselves. Uh, 
we are a new person. We're trying to develop the mind of Christ and the reality of who he is. That should be our focus in our lives. Uh, and we all, I think we all realize you are the temple. You are the temple and Yeshua with the Messiah is the temple cleanser. I mean, he did it physically in the gospel accounts. We see that, but when you look at it spiritually and you realize who you are in Christ, in the Messiah, you are that temple. And we're going to see the many scriptures that tell you that over and over again. Um, how that should be, these days should be real game changers. All the holy days should be so exciting to us when you really focus on Jesus Christ being the reason for these seasons. And uh, it was it's good, you know, to get the leaven out of your, your house, but it's most important to get the leaven out of here, get the leaven out of our hearts and our minds and draw ever closer to him every day. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 11. This is when the disciples said, uh, Lord, teach us to pray the way John the Baptist taught his disciples. And this is just one part of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That is a whole lot more than asking a blessing on your meal. A whole lot more. That's important too. But you're asking, you're asking the Father, I need the living bread. I need the bread from heaven. I need the true bread that the Father gives. And that should be part of our thinking, part of our prayer life. Getting back to what we read there in uh, Exodus 13, 6, it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And I talked about that uh, if, uh, which isn't in, in there, but uh, in Hezekiah's time, they did. 14 days God honored it let's see if we could look at a deeper reason a few deeper reasons for keeping eating unleavened bread and to uh, what's the word maybe kick it up a notch in our lives look at some reasons why we're eating this unleavened bread at this time of the year and maybe even extended time it wouldn't be a bad idea to take a little uh, extra feast of unleavened bread throughout the year if you feel you need a, a boost, uh, maybe examining yourself and the reality of eating the true bread from heaven. We're going to go to John chapter 6, which is all about the true bread from heaven. So we're going to hit quite a bit of this. John chapter 6. And verse 29. John 6 and verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Here you have a red letter definition of what the work of God is. Remember we saw talk about the church, we got to do the work, got to do the work. Here you have in the master's mouth what the work of God is that you believe on the one that the father has sent which is Yeshua the Messiah verses 35 through 40 John 6 verses 35 through 40 and Jesus said unto them I am the bread of life he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. 
And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That phrase is going to be repeated just in John chapter 6 four times. And if you remember in dealing with uh, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, Martha said, I know, Lord, you're going to raise him up at the last day. She was there. She heard this this being preached. She knew exactly he'd be raised up at the last day. But he taught her something a little, little deeper, that he is the resurrection. And, of course, Lazarus was going to be brought back to life. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father, which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I remember we used to quote this all the time. When we look around at people and say, how can you not understand this? <laughs> and it, the reality is the Father has to draw you. He has to draw you to his Son, who is the door. Jesus says, I am the door. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So he draws you to the door, Yeshua the Messiah, then the Messiah takes you to the Father. Beautiful plan. Verses 47 through 51. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Verses 53 to 59. Then Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him as the living father has sent me and I live by the father so he that comes he that eats me even he shall live by me this is that bread which came down from heaven not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead he that eats of this bread shall live forever these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum Four times he's telling you, I will raise you up at the last day. He's telling you that you have to eat this bread, his body. And I don't know about you, I am so grateful that he is the Lamb of God. I'm so grateful I don't have to go out and, and get a young lamb. Uh, and him giving us those symbols of unleavened bread and wine. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. It's, uh, wow. Wow. Like I said, I'm grateful for that. I'd have a tough time. <laughs> uh, but as you eat, as you eat that unleavened bread during this week, think, thank, pray, rejoice in the reality of the Father and Yeshua dwelling inside of you. I have to go to this scripture my probably my favorite scripture uh john chapter 14 john chapter 14 starting in verse 15 to 23 and this is something that yeshua repeats many times in the book of john it says if you love me keep my commandments and I will pray that the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
but he's coming with an added benefit. Get to that. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in, the, in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Our abode is our home, our tabernacle, our dwelling place. You know, when you think of the reality, and to keep a humble mind about it, you know, sometimes if somebody ever says to you, who do you think you are? Well, that's a loaded question. If you realize that they are living inside of you, by the covenant that you've, they've extended to us, the covenant of partaking of the body and blood of the Messiah, and them living inside of you now, how exciting it could be, should be, eating some unleavened bread all the time, I think. And maybe even having some wine with that, too. The wine would be good with that. Like I said, I had an opportunity. I I found wine from Galilee and also wine from Israel. Uh, the wine from Israel is a little drier, but the Galilean wine is good, too. I'm not saying it's coming from where he t- turned the water into wine, but... It's coming from that area, which is is pretty exciting. Need to think about. I would encourage you, during the days of unleavened bread, read chapters, John's chapters, 13 through 17. Chapter 17 is his last prayer. Uh, It's directed to you, that prayer. 40 times, at least 40 times, the pronouns he uses, like they, them, it's talking about the believers and even verse 26 of John 17 talks about those who are going to come to believe on me through the disciples words that's us many years later 2,000 years later uh, these words are still alive first right. Corinthians chapter 3 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. I like these scriptures by Paul. I'll tell you what, it really gets you thinking. It says here in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He has to be the foundation. And in verses 16 and 17, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. One of our goals is to be holy people. Uh, Even seeking perfection, we're not there yet, but to consider yourself holy. You know, that's something that Peter mentions. Be you holy. And you know where that's taken from? That's taken from Leviticus 11. After he gives you a list of what to eat and what not to eat. So some people say, ah, food doesn't matter. Diet doesn't matter. You know, that you guys think too physically? No. You're showing that there is a difference. There is it even to the point of what you eat, what you put in your body. Uh, and he wants us to be holy. And he does call certain things abominations. We're aware of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 
which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, salvation, we often hear it's a free gift. It is a gift. But as far as being free, the highest price ever paid was when the Messiah laid down his life for all of us and for the world. You know, like John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a big price. He gave up the glory, the honor of being part of the, the family of Elohim to come in the flesh. And one of the main purposes of coming in the flesh had the power to bring many sons and daughters, children of God, into the family of God. What an exciting plan to, to think you understand that. I talked a while back about why do you understand these things? Everybody else looks at you like a deer in the headlights, but you're thinking, wow, this is privileged information. That's why we got to really go after it with a passion even as we eat our unleavened bread, do it, do it with excitement, with uh, joy. Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses sixteen and seventeen. And it says, "What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said." I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. You know, sometimes people see what we do and they think it's kind of silly. And without making fun of anybody, but we all know some of the customs around the holidays, not the holy days. The holidays have some really silly ideas. And we all know what those ideas are. Uh, and even there we gotta look with an eye that one day their eyes are gonna be opened and they will have an opportunity to remove some of that stuff from their lives the same way we had to do. Now you look back at that and you think, wow, I can't believe I was involved in all of that stuff. All of those, uh, wow. Unbelievable practices. That's a miracle too. That he opens your eyes to that. And remember, like back what we read in Second Chronicles, uh, chapter thirty-one, verse one, how they destroyed all the idols once, once they made a commitment to get back to the eternal, get back to his Passover. It, it fired them up. It made change. And that's what these these days should do to us. Uh, I know prior to this, we all examine ourselves, but even during this week, it's time to examine yourself. Maybe see where where you might have let down, you know. Uh, so many times we are warned, like even in the book of Revelation with the seven churches, get back. <laughs> get back to your first love. Get back to studying, praying, taking time, fasting. I wouldn't fast this week, though. I would. Uh, this is a week of celebration and eating that unleavened bread. First John chapter three and verse two. First John chapter three and verse two. It says, "Beloved, now are we the sons of God." And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're sons of God now. We're children of God, sons and daughters of God now. Because of what's been extended to us, because of the Father and Son living inside of us. But the greater part, when the change comes, when the putting off of the flesh and entering the spirit life, that's going to be exciting. That you can only imagine. 
I think, I think of uh, our sister Jeanette Galicki. She she's quoting this all the time. I think this must be one of her favorites. Uh, but it's a beautiful truth. It's just it's awesome. First John chapter four and verse four. It says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is talking about false prophets, even false presenters of misrepresenting Messiah. You've got to remember, the adversary is a clever counterfeiter. He counterfeits everything. He counterfeits the holy days. He counterfeits commandments. He does all kinds of things. But with God's spirit and them living inside of you, they will keep you on the, the straight and narrow track, heading towards holiness, heading toward that time when we are going to be changed, when he, he raises us up, uh, when he returns. I personally wouldn't mind being alive till he comes back and go to <laughs> change, but even if we don't live till that time, we won't realize how much time goes by. It'll be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that would be wonderful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 13 through 17. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But with the temptation also may a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. That temptation could be trials, temptations of persecutions, basically what he's talking about here, and even being led away through some of our lusts. He's also talking about idolatry. He says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry, then he says, I'm speaking as to wise men. Judge you what I'm saying here. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? That word communion means the fellowship, the oneness that we share. Verse 17, for we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Something you might want to try this week. Try to get together with brethren. Share some unleavened bread with them. If you're married, that's great. That's wonderful. But there's guys up in my area that I, I hope to get together with and uh, share some unleavened bread. Throw them a real curveball. Tear, break a piece off and hand it to them. See what he does. Sorry. <laughs> see what they do because we are sharing the greatest common ground in the world what we share as brothers and sisters in the faith the world is clueless about that and it's not a simple like many churches have a, a communion service and they do certain things this is different this is much different it's about the camaraderie the deepness that we have the expectations we have of what's to come. Amazing, beautiful truth. So share some unleavened bread and maybe some wine with the brethren in the right places, okay? Here's the, the bottom line. We have been set free. What an emancipation proclamation. We were slaves. Just like the Israelites were slaves. The perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God has set us free from that death penalty. You remember what we, when we first, uh, our eyes were first opened. I love those early memory scriptures. First John three four, sin is the transgression of the law. Romans six twenty three, what you earn for sin, the wages of sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. To realize that and understand that. Wow. So, this week and all the time, put out what needs putting out of your life. 
you know, we're on a path of overcoming. Overcoming never stops. But put in, put in the true bread from heaven. Have an inspiring days of unleavened bread.